Okay, so I guess we're ready. Yeah. All right. So this evening I'm going to discuss the guns of August, World War One, that is. Uh, but, but, but before I uh, do that, I want to uh, <coughs> ask all of you a question. Since, as you all know, we live in dangerous times, especially I'm sure if any of you drove here on the freeways, um, you took your life in your hands. There's some crazy people out there. The question is, can someone who is already dead kill you? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Besides the vice president. <laughs> Can he kill your family? Can he kill your nation? Can he kill civilization? So, the first slide, if you would. So, as you know, Cheney and company are engaged in uh, some nefarious activity highlighted by Lynn's recent pamphlet or, or flyer, rather, on Cheney's, stopping Cheney's guns of August. Now, Cheney and company may be the instrument that could detonate a preemptive nuclear strike against Iran which would unleash the potential of horrific devastation globally and plunge humanity into a new dark age. However, Cheney is not the cause, the generative force behind the immediate crisis. This crisis started really with the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Now, what was the cause of the First World War? Of course, it was the first one, so nobody called it the First World War. It was the Great War, the World War. Next slide. Now, this is Freddie's friend, the Archduke Franz <laughs> Ferdinand. <laughs> heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and he was assassinated he was shot on June 28, 1914 by a, a 19 year old Gavilo Princip he was a member of the Serbian Black Hand or the Young Serbian Movement created in London of course and the Austro-Hungarian Empire had at that time annexed Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Albania after the Balkan Wars. On July 28th, following that assassination, the Austro-Hungarian dual monarchy declared war on Serbia. The following day, July 29th, Tsar Nicholas II of Russia mobilized the military of Russia to defend his Slavic friends in Serbia. On August 1st, Germany, following the Austro-Hungarian alliance, declares war on Russia. August 3rd, Germany declares war on France. August 4th, Germany declares war on Belgium. August 4th, the same day, busy day. Britain, because of its triple entente with France and Germany, its treaty agreements, declares war on Germany. On August 10th, following at least initially the von Schlieffen plan, the German military begins rolling into Belgium. Now, since LaRouche has issued this statement on the guns of August and stopping Cheney, 
I'm sure some of you have probably run to the uh, library uh, to uh, look at the name of the book, The Guns of August, by Barbara Tuckman. Um, if you looked in our library, you didn't find it because I have it. <laughs> now, some of you may believe that the ill-informed Barbara Tuckman, like her, that, the, that Germany was the cause of the Great World War. And perhaps the United States did the right thing in joining the British Empire, our good friends, in that war. If so, you are profoundly mistaken, tragically, fatally mistaken. And I'll show you why. My mother once confessed to me that she never understood World War I. She couldn't understand it. Uh, and it's not, <coughs> it's, it's a common phenomena among uh, honest thinking Americans. <coughs> Why is that? Because we have all been lied to. That's why we don't understand it. And not unlike the present circumstances, lies brought us into the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. So, also, it was not just, was it just that 19-year-old kid who killed the Archduke that just precipitated a chain of events and started a world war? You know, and, and just, just people were just on edge in the various uh, capitals around Europe and they just started mobilizing the military. And, uh, and, and just things got out of hand. <laughs> you know, we really didn't want a war. We wanted a show of force and, and so on and so on. Things just got bloody out of hand. This kind of, you know, uh, shit happens theory of history. <laughs> and, you know, this is sometimes stated in regards to, to this book by Tuckman which was referenced, uh, the most famous reference by John F. Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis, saying he didn't want somebody to write a book about him like Barbara Tuckman and wrote about the guns of August, claiming that he didn't want some hothead in the Pentagon or on some naval, U.S. naval ship to start firing at the Russians and bring about World War III. But that's not how World War I started. It is not the cause it's not just some incident that got out of hand. It was deliberate, it was conscious, and it was many years in the making. The important question to ask in history is never what. Never what happened. Though we are going to examine how it happened, the most important question is why it happened. It's the only way to learn from it. Now the key inflection point to understand the cause of the Great World War began in 1914, at least the shooting part, the major shooting part. Uh, we have to look back in history. And we're going to begin by looking at the 1876 centennial celebration that's, that occurred in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. If we could show the next slide. And these are actual uh, pictures of the opening of that ceremony. And it was quite an event. It was the best organized exposition internationally at, that had ever been done because the military deployed the Army Corps of Engineers that built the railroads from the town into the exposition uh, in, the, in the adjacent park. Hey, Mark. Yeah. Do these buildings still stand? This one does. The Arts Building, it's the only one that's still there. And it's uh, uh, the, uh, if you go to the next slide, we'll see that the one of the uh, key people behind, not just the exposition itself, but the ideas, the technology, the economics behind what that exposition, particularly by the Americans represented and our allies, was John uh, Charles Carey, the world's leading economist at that time, uh, based in Philadelphia. 
Likewise, Friedrich List represented those American system ideas that he, after coming over to the United States with Lafayette in 1824 and collaborating with Henry Carey's father, Matthew Carey, went back to replicate the ideas of Alexander Hamilton that created the industrial development and agricultural development of the United States following the Revolutionary War. And List brought those ideas back to replicate it, as he said consciously, in Germany, uh, creating the Zollverein, the uh, tariff trade uh, customs house, the beginnings of railroads in Germany, dredging the uh, Danube and so forth explicitly on the model created by Alexander Hamilton and further developed by Henry Carey, what we call the American system of economics, something you won't learn in any college in the United States, unless somebody like you goes in and starts talking about the Rouge and so on. <coughs> and there are, this, this was the prime motivation and ideas behind the exposition that brought together collaborators internationally because the idea of the American system is always as an international phenomenon, an idea. The project that was being undertaken centered around Carey and his circle was to create the first land bridge. People are familiar today with the LaRouche's proposal to create a Eurasian land bridge to link Europe, Western Europe with Asia right? and throughout the entire subcontinent thereof. Well, that idea is not new. It was put forward by Carey and others at that time who collaborated to build such a project back then. The, pr the objective was not simply a railroad. It was the destruction of the British Empire. That was the prime objective, once and for all. It included, as part of that project, making Germany a superpower and America's partner in world development. Two, industrialization of Russia and China with thousands of railroad miles as the, as the uh, vehicle to do that. Industrial development of Japan to counter the influence of the British in Asia. Four, worldwide electrification. And five, the necessary upgrading of labor conditions of humanity, a necessary role if you're actually going to modernize, industrialize the rest of the world. And the Carey Circle, uh, the Carey Circle planned to uh, and undertook the beginnings to organize an uprising in Ireland, uh, supported by President Garfield at the time, arming Russia militarily, particularly with uh, with uh, ships, as one of the one of the uh, plans that was undertaken for a joint U.S.-Russia effort to destroy the British. Now, the centennial took place, 1876, the celebration of the uh, Declaration of Independence. By that time, we had constructed the Transcontinental Railroad in the United States, which was finished, started under Lincoln, and was finished in 1869. This was the first great project we had actually accomplished, and its significance was global, because it, it linked both the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans the, we saw such people as Dmitry Mendeleev who attended that exposition to research the extraction and production of oil which was first done in Pennsylvania and he wrote back to the Tsar an account of the exposition including a proposal for a tariff for Russia which was implemented by the Tsar. Let's see the next slide. One of the most important events was the meeting of Thomas Edison and Emil Rathenau from Germany at the exposition. Edison was there. He had won a prize that he was exhibiting for a quadruplex telegraph technology which was able to uh, transmit four different messages along a telegraph wire simultaneously. A year after the, uh, the exposition, 1877, he invented the uh, phonograph and in two years after that, the incandescent light. So a partnership grew up with Rathenau and Edison that included the creation of, the, of a joint project that built uh, electrical generation plants in Germany and that quickly expanded into Poland, the electrification of railroads there, and then into Russia. 
The idea was to electrify and light, that is, bring electric lights to the entire world. That was in particularly the vision of, of Rathenau, and it was shared by Edison, obviously. Go to the next slide. You'll see the centerpiece of that exposition, the greatest and largest machine ever built by man. This was the Corliss engine, named after the man who built it, George Corliss of Rhode Island. And uh, this machine weighed 70 tons. It was shipped to Philadelphia from Providence, Rhode Island in 56 railroad cars. It stood at a height of 40 feet. The engine had two cylinders with 40-inch bores and 10 strokes. That's, there's two of these. And the flywheel was 30 feet in diameter, weighed 55 tons. It had a 36 revolutions per minute without making any noise and uh, would normally produce about 100, uh, or one, uh, I'm sorry, 1,400 horsepower. But it actually usually ran at 2,520 horsepower and engaged a large piston under the uh, uh, stage here that you see, which drove a, uh, eight lines of shafting, 10,400 feet, which was connected to belts to drive over 100 machines in Machinery Hall. If you show the next slide, you'll see uh, a picture of some of those machines being powered by this engine. If you go to the next slide, you'll see a depiction of the opening ceremony, which occurred on May 10th of that year, with President Ulysses S. Grant and Dom Pedro, Emperor of Brazil, uh, opening up the exposition by turning on the Corliss engine. Now, various new technologies were premiered by the Americans at this exposition. It included the internal combustion engine using hydrocarbon, refrigeration using an ammonia compressor to make ice, a steam elevator machine by Otis Brothers Company, electromagnetic generator and the telephone exhibited by Ale its inventor Alexander Bell. Next slide, you'll see a, the world's first monorail, which was not built in Disneyland, <laughs> but in Philadelphia, steam powered. Right? And this exhibition had an international impact. Of course, we had numerous countries from around the world that participated, that were sought out to participate, including various colonies of the British Empire. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see back forward. There you go. Just an example of some of that. You have uh, France, which you had uh, Bartholi's Light. This is actually uh, uh, later uh, attached to the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. Egypt was organized to attend by George Boker, who was the local poet of Philadelphia, he was the ambassador to Russia and then to Egypt who organized both those nations to attend. Germany, statue of Alexander von Humboldt was dedicated on July 4th. It's still at the park. Brazil, China, next slide. You'll see the building that the Japanese brought over, prefabricated, constructed with no nails, put up at the exhibition. This is a picture of the uh, Irak uh, Irakura uh, mission that had gone on uh, leaving from Japan in uh, 1870 on a tour of the United States for 18 months meeting in particular with the Cary Circles in Philadelphia and then through Europe. On their return to Japan, they completely iced out the British and the, and the Americans became the dominant force in Japan's adoption of American system economics, transforming Japan from a feudalist society and economy with the Meiji Restoration in 1868, within a generation to becoming a modern nation. With a lot of problems, but nonetheless, a prime example of what can be done in a very short period of time uh, with the collaboration of their 
co-thinkers in the United States. Uh, go to the next slide, you'll see the, the, the key technology for all of this was railroads. And this is uh, an example of the Baldwin locomotives exhibited near the uh, Corliss machine, one of the wings of Machinery Hall. It was not the only locomotive company uh, located in Philadelphia, but the most prominent. And these locomotives were built in parts and shipped internationally for reconstruction in China, in Europe, South America, and elsewhere. You go to the next slide, you'll see this is a, an example uh, projection done by uh, Brookings, one of the collaborators of, uh, of War Wharton Baker, actually, um, in Philadelphia, which was exporting Baldwin engines to China. And this was the proposed routes immediately for, for uh, the railroads there. Of course, later Sun Yat-sen develops an entire network grid uh, proposal for China. <coughs> Next slide, you'll see the Baghdad to Ber or Berlin to Baghdad Railroad. This was the proposal not fully completed, undertaken by the Germans. And the Germans uh, coming out of this were uh, involved in building railroads in quite a few places, Venezuela, other places in South America, and this one in particular that stretched for the first time. You think about this, there's, there's yet to be a railroad built from Europe that connects Africa or <laughs> the Middle East. It's ridiculous. But this one had proposed to go all the way from Berlin through the Balkans down into Turkey and going from there through the Middle East, uh, ending up in the uh, uh, southern part of Iraq and into the, uh, into the water there at the, at the outlet. This was prevented by the British by uh, some skullduggery diplomatic moves and also by backing the Shahab family, a bunch of pirates to create Kuwait at that time, the independent nation of Kuwait run by pirates that blocked the water access uh, to the Gulf by the British. So <coughs> next you see the next slide is one of the most uh, important projects was the construction of the Trans-Siberian Railroad actually undertaken in the late 60s with the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers under Whistler going to Russia to begin the process of, of laying out railroad construction for, with the Russians which eventually became the Trans-Siberian Railroad. This is about um, 8,000 miles. And you're talking about going from St. Petersburg on the Baltic Sea to Vladivostok. And this was undertaken uh, in a major way in the, uh, the last part of the 1890s, actually in 1901, with Count Vita, who was the foreign minister under the Tsar, who was a proponent and student of Liszt, Listian's uh, economics. And Liszt always polemicized in his national uh, book on national economy for the creation of an alliance between France, Russia, and Germany to develop the Eurasian landmass. And this is precisely the outlook that Vita had, the construction of this rail line, hopefully uh, going south before you hit Vladivostok, going into, uh, into what is we call Korea today. Uh, there was some contention over who owned that piece of real estate. Uh, but, but this, the purpose of which was to foster development, and the only way it could function is to foster development economically in this part of Asia. That was the idea. It was not to uh, expand imperialism or some ridiculous thing which the British later continued to say so <coughs> this, was, this is absolutely central. Next slide, you'll see the proposal. It's, it's a little hard to see here, I think. But this is the actual proposal that came out of a, a study of seven corps of Army engineers that surveyed all of uh, South America and Central America for railroad construction throughout the entire continent. And this program was released in 1898 under the auspices of the International Railway Commission as part of Senator Blaine's 
work in particular, working with people like Matias Romero in Mexico, uh, formerly the ambassador of the United States under Benito Juarez. This was the proposal. This was what the world would look like if the Americans and the people who thought like Americans elsewhere in the world got their way. That humanity would be uplifted through this kind of development. Who would lose? Well, those who didn't want that, who wanted humanity to live like a bunch of animals, as they do to this day. You look at the next map, this is what concerns the British. You're talking about rail lines that will connect Western continental Europe with the rest of the Eurasian landmass where the vast bulk of humanity lives. Lots of yellow and brown people that need those goods. Right? What was the British policy based on? It was based on controlling the sea lanes. And we'll show a little bit more detail about that later. They did not want this. Their strategy as a response to the American system ideas and collaborators that we had internationally was to prevent this at all costs. Right? And we'll see the kind of wars that the British unleashed. Everyone here has heard of the term geopolitics? Right? Well, geopolitics is a reaction to these ideas. Right? That's why it was created, to stop this kind of development explicitly. It's not just some new kind of idea. It's a stupid idea. Saying that, that humanity, the people of a various nation, their identity comes from the earth that they live on. Right? God help us. Where does it come from? It comes, it comes specifically from the British oligarchy. And I'll get to that in a little. No, no, no. I'm saying the idea, the idea of geopolitics. Yeah. Yes, yes. Which is what you're, what's your definition of geopolitics? That politics is determined by... By the British oligarchy and not by the individual. No, they're saying that, it, that what determines politics is land, right? Oceans, geographical formations, and that people's traits actually come from these particular geographical locations. That it's, that it's based on their physical existence, not on an idea. Right? And to control Russia, Germany, or uh, the British had to, they created a war in Afghanistan. They did not want Russia to have a warm port, for instance. That's part of geopolitics. And I'll get into a little bit more of that. I just want to give people an a introduction to this. Now, what was the British official response to the American Centennial Exposition. <clears throat> British engineer wrote that official response, John Anderson. Quote, if we are to be judged by the comparison with the Americans in 1876, as doubtless we shall be in the minds of other nations and in their official reports, it is more than probably that the effect will be to confirm that we are losing our former leadership and it is passing to the Americas. Unquote. As I, as I said, the British response is a series of wars, as we'll see. I can't name them all because there's like every three or four months there's a war. Uh, <coughs> geopolitics and what evolved and became known as the Great Game, that is control of the Eurasian heartland to control all of this mass of humanity. Now, how could there be a world war, though? Even if some... some somebody gets shot in, in uh, Sarajevo, what, why would that start a world war? I mean, th at the time, in 1914, there were many popular opinions that thought it would be impossible to have such a, a phenomenon occur. It could never happen. The socialists at the time thought that it wouldn't happen because the workers of the, the international workers of the world would unite and prevent such a terrible thing from occurring. Wow. This is a popular theory. And there was the ever popular, it's too horrible, they will never let it happen. The almighty they. And then there's, well, anyway, what can I do about it? Forget about it. 
Then you have the aristocratic theory that the crown heads of Europe are united and would never allow such a full-fledged conflagration to occur. Next slide. And sitting on that, on all those crown heads of Europe and most of the rest of the world is Vicky. <laughs> Queen Victoria, Empress of India, and the British Empire. Now, Vicky literally was the head of the European family of royalty in Europe. And she died in 1901, leaving six children, 40 grandchildren, 37 great-grandchildren, including four future monarchs of the British Empire. Next slide. You'll see this is a, a little family reunion at the funeral of uh, Prince Albert, uh, Vicky's husband, who died. And you can see uh, Nicholas Tsar II here. I think this is William II, the Kaiser of Germany, and various other uh, royalty. And she was directly related or by marriage to the royal houses of Greece, Romania, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and Belgium. Go to the next slide. This is uh, Vicky with uh, uh, Tsar Nicholas II, uh, whom she called my dear Nikki, <laughs> and uh, who married her granddaughter. And uh, her eldest son, Edward VII, the Prince of Wales, who married the daughter of the King of Denmark, and his daughter married the King of Norway. Here you see Vicky uh, with her nephew. Uh, this is Tsar, or rather Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. Right. So there was a, a certain argument that, you know, a family feud maybe, but a world war? I don't think so. Next slide. All right. This is the scumbag who organized World War I. Deliberately, consciously, King Edward VII of the British Empire. And when he, he was the architect of World War, as a means to create the British Empire as the primus inter paris, the first among equals of the world. That was his objective. And he's often was called at the time the uncle of Europe. Truly, he was the murderer of Europe. And he died in 1910, before his war started. And when he died, this funeral consisted of nine crowned kings of Europe, seven queens, and this is what Tuckman starts her book with, this funeral, seven heirs apparent, including the Archduke Ferdinand, and Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> Attending was Kaiser Wilhelm II. Uh, he was relieved to bury the encircler, as he was affectionately called, that was an infection term. And Willie had said of Edward that he is Satan. You cannot imagine what a Satan he is. Now, when this is, yes, this is William II, Kaiser of Germany. Now, when the war breaks out, finally, in, in uh, 1914, just days before it breaks out, Kaiser Wilhelm says, quote, the world will be engulfed in the most terrible of wars, the ultimate aim of which is the ruin of Germany. England, France, and Russia have conspired for our annihilation, that it is the naked truth of the situation which has slowly but surely created by Edward VII. The encirclement of Germany is at least an accomplished fact. We have run our heads into the noose. The dead Edward is stronger than the living I. 
unquote. Now, just a little bit of family history. Edward's the seventh's first son, Prince Albert Victor Edward, is the prime su suspect in the Jack the Ripper cases of 1888-89. And chief of the London police, General Sir Charles Warren, ran the cover-up. Chief of Police was also the master of the newly formed Scottish Rite Masonic Lodge, the Quattro Coronati, established by warrant from the Grand Commissioner of British Freemasonry, Edward VII. Now, young Bertie, as he was called, uh, spent an entire year of higher education at Oxford and Cambridge, during which time he visited the United States in 1860, undoubtedly to make sure things were going well for the U.S. Civil War, which broke out shortly after. And actually had, there was a parade for him in New York City at the time, he being the Prince of Wales. Yeah, it's Edward VII. No, his nickname was Bertie. We'll just call him Eddie from now on, okay? Okay? We don't want to mix up the two evils. It just could be a little too dangerous. So, in fact, Edward VII was trained by Lord Palmerston, famous, and you must remember this always, quote, Britain has no permanent allies, only permanent interests, unquote as we shall see in the course of the events leading up to World War I. It is true then as it is today. Now, Edward, I mean, everybody talks about the Kaiser being a dictator and so on and so forth. Edward was a dictator. He ran foreign policy for the British Empire down to the smallest detail. There was no discussion with Parliament. Of course, there never really is any discussion with Parliament that's meaningful to this day. <coughs> But Edward ran foreign policy, and he ran an international network of dupes, uh, thugs, and co-conspirators in setting up this war. Are you drawing parallels to like today, how um, they run and they don't tell Americans about this foreign policy or what's going on in foreign countries, and they just uh, do whatever they want? Is that what? In part, you said they, that this would go back to Cheney, and I was just wondering if that was your connection. It'll go back. I'm trying to make a, a, a more uh, profound point about history than just Cheney, but I think that I, you have a profound one right there. I, I, yeah, I, I'm trying to. I'm trying. <laughs> I am trying to get at at using the example of the guns of August from World War One to to examine the causes of that war, like today. Of World War One. Yeah, that's what we're that's what we're going to be. That's what we're examining. And to use that to reflect on what's going on today. Do you ever Certainly. examine the causes of yeah what's yeah, going yeah, on today? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like in in here in meetings. Yes, but I will. Let me just finish, and then we'll have plenty of time for <laughs> okay. discussion. That's that's fine. Okay. Uh, now, Edward knew. I mean, there were various people that he worked with in in uh, Great Britain. The Churchill family, Winnie, uh, Winston, and so on, is, is a prime example. The, the Joseph Chamberlain, and, and so on. But he also knew every monarch of Europe personally, and some quite intimately. And he was known as the Rake of Europe. And it didn't matter if you were man, woman, transvestite, <laughs> like uh, your. Sh uh, Yoshoi, I can't remember his name, uh, uh, this, this famous transvestite who had an affair with in London, or actually in Paris. He, met at the, he sent him a note at the Paris Opera House. He was, he was, late, he was a, a, one of the most wealthy, in the most wealthy family in Russia, later assassinated uh, Rasputin. But I, I don't want to go there. <laughs> I just want to make you aware of that fact. <coughs> Now, as I said, he died in 1910. Unfortunately, he had already set events into motion 
that would inevitably lead to the Great War. Uh, barring the necessary leadership to stop it. And then, like now, that leadership was demanded from the United States. And it was found wanting at that time in the United States. How did Edward do it? Referring to the war. 1870. Germany becomes a United Nations state. Edward VII immediately saw this as a threat to the oligarchical rule of the British Empire. 1875 to 76, Edward was in India to prepare for the Afghan war, aimed at Russia. Now, the British oligarchical response to the American system threat internationally was seen through the creation of geopolitics. The goal is to establish a single world empire. They wanted to do what the Romans didn't succeed in doing, or any other empire previously. That was their goal. Halford Mackinder, head of the London School of Economics, was credited for founding the so-called branch of politics called geopolitics, and brought into it a number of people from, we would call them British intelligence, to run various operations internationally. The idea was to control the Eurasian heartland. That was the center. As I mentioned, this is what they called or, and became known as the great game. How to manipulate not just nations, but tribes, people to accomplish that task. And to ensure that the British Empire stayed dominant through its control of the sea. Or as, as they, the saying used to go, go, Britain rules the waves. Or if more honestly, waves the rules. Next slide. Now this is one of the major collaborators and protégés of Edward VII. This is Admiral Jackie Fisher, the most outspoken, virulent proponent of war with Germany. And he wanted to create... Now his idea was a preemptive war against Germany. He wanted to do what he called Copenhagen, the German fleet which is what the British did during the Napoleonic Wars to the French in, uh, in, uh, off Copenhagen. The next slide you'll show, see the areas, the prime areas, and this map is not, maybe you can see it a little in the background. The pink area is the British Empire, including Canada. And to this day, it's part of the British Empire. The circles I put here show some of the strategic seaway lanes that the British wanted to maintain and did. Gibraltar to control the access to the Mediterranean. Gibraltar to this day is a British colony. The Suez Canal, which they finally took from the French who built it. Right? So you have access from the Mediterranean to the Gulf and into the Indian Sea. Here you have, the, of course, India, access here. The Straits of Malacca, very important. The majority of sea traffic to this day goes through this small strait dominated by Singapore, another British colony. Of course, you have Australia. You have uh, several locations in China. And, of course, their, inf their presence in the New World um, Unfortunately, we didn't enforce the Monroe Doctrine uh, strong enough, but in the Caribbean, the Falklands, excuse me, Malvinas Islands, mm -hmm. right, Canada, and there is a, just a host of islands throughout the oceans, which are, in, in many cases to this day, still British colonies. This was their idea. Control the, the choke points of navigation to move goods, prevent development of the Eurasian heartland right? and prevent above all else Germany under the influence of these Listian American ideas from linking up with Russia because then you would have a unstoppable economic power in the eyes this was a bad thing of course in the eyes of King Edward VII stop all these railroads in the heartland next slide 
Really quick, Mark, what yeah. was the lavender on there? What was the... Back. Can you go back, Tony? It's the French. Oh, that's the French? That's the French. This is part of French Africa. Is it in Vietnam at that time, too? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, isn't it funny, though? I mean, isn't, uh, wasn't the royal family, like, of a German house? Yes. And they, they were, like, Germanophobes? Yes, this goes, this <laughs> goes back to the George the First from Hanover. <laughs> they detested the Germans, but they were German. Yeah, but that's, that cuts to the point. <laughs> right? What are they really upset about? It? When, it, when, it all, when it comes down to it, as racist as they are, it's the idea they hate. Uh -huh. <laughs> right? <laughs> what idea? The idea of this American system idea of economics. So the, of the like idea of... Uh, the, it, fundamentally, it's the idea of a nation-state that can seek its own future, that has rule over itself. Even though you had nominal, in some cases, uh, uh, monarchies, right? You had something else going a lot of these countries that was, a com like, like Germany in particular, you had a commitment to this modernization process to uplift the living standards of the entire population, right? You, you had that in, in, in other places as well. That is what the British hate. What the British, and when I say British, I'm not talking about the, the British people. I'm talking about the British monarchy and the, and the royal families. What they hate to this day is the very idea of what this nation was founded on and hate this nation because of it. This idea that man can rule himself through reason. They don't believe that. They believe in, in their identity is located in their physical existence. That they are better than other people because of some arbitrary quirk of fate that they were born into this royal family and destined to rule the rest of humanity as cattle. And that's how they see humanity, as cattle. We have a completely different idea. You have to as imperialists, there are our enemy then. Cause What's that? As imperialists, there are imperialists. Yes. The British. So, like, didn't we... <laughs> Tony, can you stop, please? <laughs> Thank you. They're our they're biggest, biggest ally, right, in Iraq. Well, it depends what you what's what's the goal. They're allied to do what? To help destroy the United States, maybe? I don't know. That's a that'd be good for the British. So they sent armies to Iraq to destroy the United States? The British? Well, is it in our interest? Huh? Is it in our interest to be in Iraq? Well, um I think it's yeah, they're oil interests or whatever. You have to ask qui bono, who, who benefits, who profits? Um, and whose interest is sending three. U.S. troops to Afghanistan or Iraq? Cheney. He's for it. It's not really in the interest of the people of the United States, I don't think. Okay. So there's something else going on that's even bigger than just Iraq, I think. Maybe that the United States is imperialist? And it's not just well, Britain. it's not just the United States. There's obviously a fight going on right here now in the United States as to what the policy should be. What is the lawful policy of the United States? That's what LaRouche has brought right to their faces and to the American people. Is who has the right to do this? So, and who had the right? Go to the next slide, Tony. What a dreadnought. Yeah. As Queen Elizabeth said, Spanish Armada was where the name comes from. Our dear friend, Jackie, Jackie Fisher, is involved in a massive operation backed up by the king to build the first battleships. Not that they were the first ones to come up with the idea, because the Germans were already doing it, and they were skilled at it. But a, a empire effort was put into building the first battleship, the dreadnought class, as we call them now, by Fisher. This was going to dominate or ensure the domination of the seas by the British Empire. Not just to control these sea lanes, but they had a problem because the Germans were building battleships, the first battleships, two to one the, at the rate that by the time they built this, this came out and was launched, the Germans had already built two, bigger and better. So there was already a race on as to what kind of policy, or rather what kind of... Uh, the, the idea that the, that of building these ships is not merely to to secure the sea lanes or something. It's to confront the Germans, prevent the Germans from doing what they were doing in terms of building railroads everywhere. 
along with those, those nasty Americans. So this response to, uh, in, in any event, the first, this dreadnought was launched on February 9th, 1906, by uh, King Edward himself, who uh, knocked a bottle of Australian wine against the, uh, the bow of the ship and launched it. And you'll go to the next slide, you'll see this is the sitting room of King Edward in Buckingham Palace. And sitting on his desk is not a picture of his wife, it's Jackie Fisher. So these guys work very closely. Next. Now you have a series of incidents which we'll go through to do as as uh, as uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II said Edward was out to do to encircle Germany as part of a operation to dismantle the kind of alliances that had been created with the Russians and the Germans for these development ideas. The most prominent that started to uh, to accomplish that feat for them and for Edward was the Dreyfus Affair that occurred in 1894. This was the false accusation against this Captain Alfred Dreyfus of the French military who was a Jew and who was cashiered out of the military based on false intelligence received from a guy named, later we now found out, was Esterhausen, German. And he was sent to Devil's Island. And this is a very famous case that uh, that Emile Zola led the uh, charge to rectify that in his famous Jacques article and later leading the fight in the courts to overturn it. It was finally overturned. But what happened during this affair was that it broke up. It was a vehicle to break up the existing Franco-German alliance under the foreign minister uh, Gabriel Hanato, who was a committed historian. He wasn't a career officer, actually. And he was committed to an idea of development, economic development in partnership with Germany. And there's a real paradigm for, uh, for any kind of future development, such as we had with, uh, later with uh, um, de Gaulle and Adenauer of Germany. So this created such a ruckus that uh, that uh, that uh, Hanau was actually uh, discharged from his position as foreign minister. Go to the next map, and you had an idiot who was put in to replace him called uh, De Classe. Uh, he was a sniveling little rat. Uh, <laughs> and here you have the most one of the most important events and as LaRouche has identified, the most important event that precipitated World War I, whereas before it could have been stopped. But the French capitulated to the British over Sudan. Uh, and that's, that was the stage in which the, uh, the, uh, the uh, acquiescence to the British occurred by the French. What had occurred in Sudan, of course, the country below Egypt, is that this great evangelical Christian, quote unquote, Lord General Chinese Gordon, had been holed up trying to fight off the Mahdi, basically the liberation leader of the Sudanese, and he wasn't getting reinforcements, he disobeyed orders and held himself up in Khartoum and eventually killed in a street fight. Uh, by the uh, Mahdi forces. And he was martyred, and it was a, this is a huge ruckus in the London press. Should we support him? Should we not send troops? They finally sent troops. But what the, the French were doing, the real issue was with the French, because the French, following Hanato's plan, were involved in constructing a railroad through Central Africa. And to this day, there's no railroad that goes from the eastern part of Africa to the western part of Africa. The French were trying to do that. So <clears throat> what you had is an expeditionary force that was led by Lord Kitchener down here uh, that didn't get to, to, uh, 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 to 
to Gordon in time, that's for sure, because this, uh, this, the idea of the British was they wanted to control the eastern seaboard of Africa, right? from the Red Sea down to the uh, uh, Cape Good Hope, or to the Horn of Africa. So this uh, was part of what Kitchener, uh, Kitchener was involved in ensuring occurred. Now Kitchener led this expeditionary force and defeated the French who were trying to take advantage of this situation because of this idiot, de Classe, in deploying the troops to try to occupy southern Sudan since the British seemed reluctant to reinforce their troops there. Now Kitchener did secure this uh, fight with the British at Fashoda in 19 or rather 1898 where the French capitulated they basically accepted the role of being the petite empire and we have the Entente Cordiale signed between the French government of Declasse and King Edward the seventh uh, and after which Edward visits Paris and Kitchener just to follow up, Kitchener later becomes the commander of the Boer War of South Africa, backed by Edward VII to kick out control of the Dutch. And that is in uh, 1899 to 1902. He then is appointed commander-in-chief of the British military forces in India from 1902 to 1909. At the outbreak of World War I, he is appointed Secretary of State for War. So. This is obviously a major destabilization of Europe, given this entente cordiale. Next slide, please. Of course, the number one enemy of the British, of Edward VII, is the United States of America. They had to stop America. Because if America was not stopped, everything else was for naught. That was helped along by the assassination of President William McKinley by this so-called anarchist held up by Emma Goldman, uh, safe house in New settlement house in New York City, um, a direct British operation to eliminate the President of the United States, someone who was not simply a Civil War veteran, he was an expert in American system economics during his time in the U.S. Congress after the Civil War. An expert on the man to go to, he was the go-to man on the protective tariff in particular. He was no dummy when it came to economics. And he was assassinated on September 6th at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York. The day before, he had given a speech where he outlined this vision for all of the Americas and to export rail telegraph, to communicate with the rest of the world, to lay it, the first Pacific cable line, to create an is, a canal in the isthmus of the Americas without a war, right? and a host of other projects that were for the benefit of all mankind. And uh, he praised Senator Blaine, who was known as Mr. Uh, Pan America, at that conference, and he was assassinated the following day. Now, this brings the return of the Confederates to Washington, D.C. Next slide. Because who's waiting in the wings? Just like the President Lincoln, we have a change of vice presidential candidates in the 1900 election from Hannah to Teddy Roosevelt. And this is King Eddie's pen pal who is this arch Anglophile. I mean, to say he liked the British, I mean, if you pulled down his pants and saw his underwear, it'd say, made in London. No, it's, yeah, I know, it said it on his butt. It was tattooed. This guy, who when he lost the, the governorship's race for New York the first time, he went to, he hid out in London to lick his wounds and was nurtured and educated in the ways of the world by his uncle Bullock, who had formerly been head of Confederate intelligence during the Civil War. 
And this is where he came, became such a lover of the British in particular. And this is where the first special relationship between Britain and the United States is created during the, first administ during the administration of Teddy Roosevelt. Now, Teddy writes to King Edward, his pen pal, saying, quote, The real interests of the English-speaking peoples are one, alike in the Atlantic and the Pacific. And it is Cecil Spring Rice of Sir Edward Gray's foreign office which handles Teddy Roosevelt during his administration, meeting with on a regular basis. Next slide. Here you see the real buildup for the war, a major operation personally organized by Edward VII. This is the 19, which culminated in the 1905 Russo-Japanese War. Edward personally set up the Anglo-Japanese alliance, the first one being signed in 1902. This was uh, a, an arrangement where the British built the battleships for the Japanese Navy that were used in the war against Russia. And Edward, holding his nose a bit, because he really didn't like those yellow people, but seemed it would be an, a very advantageous to the empire if he was to make an alliance with the Japanese, to use the Japanese against the Russians. Here, of course, where this is where Vitha is trying to make the terminus for the Trans-Siberian Railroad. So you'd have a warm water port here, near the, near basically Port Arthur. So you have a, an effort by Count Vita, also Prince Ito of Japan, who's a member of the, of the uh, Japanese cabinet, one of the original leaders of the Meiji Restoration, uh, fighting to prevent this war. Uh, up to the very day that the Japanese went to war. In fact, Ito was in, in Moscow at the time. So, and, and Sergei Vita was on the outs with the Tsar. So here you have a, a situation where the Japanese, with ships built by the British, launch a surprise attack at night on, uh, in 1902 into the off Port Arthur and are successful in torpedoing two of the major battleships of the Russians and sets the tone for the rest of the conflagration. The Russians lose 300,000 men and officers. They are reduced from the second naval power of the world, first being, of course, the British, to the seventh. Right? So things have gone quite nicely in the East for Eddie as a result of this war. The war, if you go to the next slide, you'll see who was chosen to be the mediator at the peace talks at the uh, treaty meeting in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, none other than T.R., Teddy Roosevelt. This is Count Vita, this very large gentleman here. And Teddy Roosevelt concludes the meeting, not terribly bad for the Russians, but not that good either. Teddy's not too fond of, of those yellow people uh, as well, but he hates the Russians more. And he wins the Nobel Peace Prize for this noble effort. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that one of the consequences of the Russo-Japanese War that fed, it, fed into what became known as the 1905 Russian Revolution, with money channeled directly through the Warburgs and others into Russia to finance this uprising to bring down the Tsar's regime. That basically to stop this Trans-Siberian Railroad project and the orientation of the current regime. And <coughs> though the revolution, quote unquote, it's not really a revolution, it was an act of terrorism <laughs> by the British to destabilize the Russian monarchy and government. Uh, in 1907, you had the Triple Entente, which was put into effect. These were agreements made treaty agreements between Britain and France and then Britain and Russia. And this was uh, personally created by Edward VII and overseen 
by Edward Gray in the Foreign Office. And that, if you see on the next slide, you'll see a few of these madmen involved in in uh, precipitating the war. I'm not, well, you know, here's here's this rat, Declasse. I really can't stand this guy. And uh, you have Clemenceau, who was involved later as a foreign minister or prime minister. He's also involved later uh, after the war with the negotiations at Versailles. We'll see that. Um, you have Alexander <coughs> Izlovsky, uh, Izbalsky. He's the Russian foreign minister who worked with Edward to create the Anglo-Russian Entente of 1907. Later ambassador to uh, um, France from Russia. And when the war breaks out, he says, this is my war. Uh, in particular, this is the guy who carried out what Edward VII had tried to do and organized the entire balance of his life in accomplishing, which was this conflagration. And that is Sir Edward Grey. Sir Edward Grey's father had uh, been the British Foreign Secretary. He'd actually uh, moved into the residence at, of, uh, of the royal family. And his son, Edward, was the godchild or godson of Edward VII. Uh, and he was the one who organized the war, the implementation of the war, after had, uh, Edward VII had died. He was the one as head of the Foreign Office. How did they do it? How did they get the war going? He lied. <laughs> he lied to convince Germany that the British would not go to war. And that is until it started. <laughs> he had to convince France and Russia that the British would honor the Triple Entente. He lied. And then to start the whole war, he had to lie to the House of Commons, to Parliament, about the real intentions of Germany, which had, for the last decade, had dominated the news as to a, p a pending invasion of Germany any day. So 1914, the Great War begins. This is why one of the reasons that the monarchs in Europe were taken uh, back, because the British had lied to them. They had all had agreements with the British that the British went back on. Go to the next slide. Here you see Europe before the war, Europe after. It's maybe a little hard to see. You have the alliance of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which includes Turkey. We'll show another map which shows those alliances a little better. That is all broken up after the war, essentially, including a great part of Germany. Go to the next slide. The, the, those participants, the victors at the Versailles Treaty after the war. Now, the, the nations in dark and black, those are the nations of the Austro-Hungarian uh, alliance with Germany. Uh, so these are the bad guys. Okay, this is who the Allies are fighting against. Right. And the dark gray is the British Empire and their allies, France, and and so forth. So the blacks in Africa. This is at the beginning of the war. This so those are German colonies in Africa. Yes, these are German colonies. But this, you say this includes uh, an alliance with the Ottomans. That's right. This is the Ottoman Empire here. Yeah. It's not just the, the showing that the black is Germany, though these are German colonies. This is also the Ottoman Empire. This is the key to, for the British to dominate the Middle East. Go to the next slide. Now this was the original German plan in the event of a war against France developed by von Schlieffen. And von Schlieffen was a bit of a genius. He was part of the old school of Prussian, the Prussian military, which ne meant that he didn't want his men 
to just follow orders. This is one of the big slanders against the German military. They just take orders. They will, they will march off a cliff if you give them the orders. It's not true at all. He took advantage of what had been developed in the, in the Prussian army as the Aufstrag, Aufstrag Taktik. That is for the, down to the infantry member to accomplish the mission given to them. That they had to figure out how to do it. If they had to take that hill, they had to figure out how to do it and change the orders if they had to do it. But what was key is not to follow instructions one by one of some battle plan, but to actually figure out how to accomplish the mission. And that's what he did here in using and developing the idea of the flank. Right? Isn't that he the same as following orders? No. No. Because and there's difference between accomplishing a mission and following a set piece of orders as you're given go through A, B, C, D, and E. Well, a guy might say, if I go to C, I'll get killed. Because <laughs> right? they've taken over this or whatever. You've got to think, you know, how to... And what is the idea? To have a, a military officer or soldier to think on their own. They have to develop a flank. Right? You can't take something on head on. That's stupid. You have to figure out how to flank it. Right? And von Schlieffen was an expert in that. He had studied history. And the French, who were always famous for being prepared to fight for fighting the last war, <laughs> had built these fortifications along the eastern part of France, Alsace, heavily fortified. So what von Schlieffen decided to do was to have the German military, you know, engage nominally these forces, to have the main force swing around in an arc through Belgium, not quite to the sea, they don't want to ex be exposed to British naval fire, and then sweep in and encircle Paris. Not to occupy it, just encircle it. The war would have been, if this had been done, the war would have been over in a week. Maybe a week and a half. Right? So this, this was the idea. Unfortunately, uh, Schlieffen died in 1913. And uh, you go to the next slide, you'll see who took over the sniveling coward, von Molke. This is the uh, Kaiser. And we, of course, you've got to talk about World War I. You've got to talk about those pointy helmets. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but this, this is not the helmet. That's his real head. Because <laughs> Molke was a coward. He did not want to engage the enemy and engage it the way it had to properly be done. Go to the next slide. You'll see what happened. He, he threw out the von Schlieffen idea and decided to confront these forces head on. Stupid. Because, look, it was known that if you, you, if you engage the enemy in an in a, in a extended conflict, uh, it's not going to be good news, especially if you've got an eastern flank. If you go to the next slide, you'll see what happened. Trench warfare, literally digging in, right? and it became a meat grinder of a war. What were the British going to do? Go to the next slide. Well, they were going to... They solicited help from their special relationships in the White House. Uh, unfortunately occupied by Woodrow Wilson. Known as a, so, a so-called historian. Actually, he did write some of the, the, uh, the script that was put into the Birth of a Nation movie, the first big full-length feature film produced in the United States by D.W. Griffith, originally called The Klaz Klansman, which Wilson promoted, the resurgence of the Klan directly from the White House, first film ever shown in the White House. Wilson was a die-hard Confederate, and he died hard. And he organized to send troops to help our enemy and got the United States into World War I. Now, he was elected in 1912. And this, is, this was a real coup at the time. After you had this filthy traitor, Teddy Roosevelt, in there, mucking up the White House, you had a resurgence of the Democratic Party that had never been seen be and, uh, since before the Civil War. You had a domination of the, of the Congress by Democrats and the White House. And these are not savory Democrats. These are not FDR Democrats. These are Confederate 
sheet wearing Democrats. All right? So, and it was also Taft, I mean, anyway, you had the birth in, in 1916. You had Pershing being deployed by Wilson into Mexico in an expedition expeditionary U.S. force that was given the orders to chase but not to capture Pancho Villa. This included General Pershing who was later to head up the U.S. expeditionary force uh, to Europe. So election comes up 1916. Wilson runs on the platform of the slogan he kept us out of the war. Right? The word already been going on since 1914. <clears throat> so you had a series of incidents that occurred not too long. In fact, it might have been a couple days before the inauguration. January 1917, the British decode a cable, trustworthy as they are, uh, between the German foreign minister, Arthur Zimmerman, to the German minister in Mexico. The contents is given over, handed over to Wilson. February 24th, the British show Wilson the, the telegraph. February 25th, the British uh, sea liner is sunk. Three Americans die. On March 1st, the telegram released by Wilson, uh, given to Wilson, is released to the press, showing obviously hostility, according to the telegram, against the United States by the Germans. Uh, on March 12th through the 16th, we have three more ships sunk in the Atlantic Ocean, American ships, uh, who are bringing supplies to the British. March, um, I'm sorry, April 2nd, Wilson delivers his war message to Congress. Four, day late, four days later, Congress declares war on Germany and its allies. Six senators did not vote for it, nor did 50 congressmen. British troops are sent to France under General Pershing. Of course, the British wanted to break up all the U.S. troops into different units to fight under the auspices of the British command. At least Pershing didn't let that happen. So, the slogan of the war. What was the slogan? Make the world safe for democracy. That was Wilson's slogan for America. It was the war to end all wars. These were two very famous slogans during the period of time in the United States. Next slide shows you some recruitment posters. Destroy this mad brute. Huh? Right? The Kaiser and his pine helmet. Right? Enlist and help stop this, the destruction of civilization by the Huns, the barbarian Russians. Next, D.W. Griffith, famous for now for his uh, reviving the Klan and his Birth of a Nation movie uh, is, in, is invited to the White House by President Wilson who had received a message from the British government to enlist D.W. Griffith's help to make a movie that would <coughs> help persuade Americans to support this war. And Griffith packs off for London, meets with Lloyd George, Queen Mum, etc. ad nauseum and makes this film, a uh, propaganda film, for the British to get the United States to support their war. Fortunately, it doesn't come out until after the war is over. Next slide. This is, this is the war. This is the destruction that it caused. This is the Cathedral of Rams being hit by artillery shells. There's no original glass any longer in the, that cathedral, though it's been rebuilt. You can see the devastation, the new weapon horrible weapon at the time was the machine gun, 50 caliber machine gun and gas. Next slide. This gives you a magnitude of the destruction never seen before, maybe since the the, uh, the uh, 60 years war. This is in France, this village is named before World War, the World War. Next slide. After the war. Next slide. This is one of many Russian mass graves. Next slide. This is a German cemetery. Right? People may be familiar with the Flanders Fields. There's a poem written about it, about the war dead of World War One. Next slide. It sort of gives you an idea of the casualty rate. 
That is, these are the mobil figures mobil mobilized. These are the people killed, wounded, prisoners, and total casualties. So in Russia, you had 1.7 1, 1. million people killed. Right? The casualty rate was 76%. That's, that's three out of every four soldiers is killed. And the French is not much better. Right? The Americans... 126,000, relatively small compared to the, the numbers that are seen in continental Europe. It's absolutely devastating. This is this is this has long-term consequences for the uh, culture and the politics of Europe and the world. Next slide. And to ensure that there would be another war. We had this conclave of the victors in Versailles in the palace of the old kings of England. Not that old, 1700s, uh, 1600s, in France. I'm not, not England, France. And these are the four major participants, Lloyd George, uh, Orlando of Italy, Clemenceau from France, and Woody. Wilson. And what came out of this was not a, a uh, uh, Westphalia treaty, but a vindictive treaty to punish the uh, nations which lost, Germany in particular, by imposing reparations without any limit. There was no dollar limit put on the reparations that Germany had to pay, including giving up colonies and so on, so-called colonies. And the imposition was an injustice that would not go away. And the conditions that were laid down at Versailles ensured there would be another war, absolutely ensured it. And you had the beginnings of the later scumbags who ran World War II and worked with the Nazis the Dulleses were involved in the reparations committee. Uh, Yalmar Schacht, later the finance minister for the Bank of England, then later for the Nazis for the Bank of England, and so on, were all involved in this reparations looting of Germany afterwards. The enemy was Germany in the eyes of the British Empire and their allies to destroy all of the industry and technology of Germany to ensure that Germany would never again pose a threat by linking up with Russia in particular to do the kinds of things I outlined earlier that Witt and others had co been committed to do and were doing. That was the objective of the British, to unleash this kind of horror upon the world and then a worse horror. Go to the next slide. I'll just show you one of the mandates coming out of the Versailles Treaty which was the carving up of the Ottoman Empire. Basically what we know today is the major borders in the Middle East. Syria, uh, Saudi Arabia, and so on. This is one of the outcomes. You go to the next slide, you'll see the outcome of World War I is the largest empire in the history of humanity. This is 1919 is the largest extent of the British Empire. They control 14,157,000 square miles of the Earth's surface. That's one quarter of the surface of the planet. And they, con they rule over one quarter of the world's population. All the former colonies of Germany and Africa, British. British, British, British still British. <laughs> still British. Even Ireland. That's part of it. All right? So this this is the this is the outcome of World War 1. The gr the creation of the largest empire in the history of mankind. And the people who rule over are not beneficent leaders to say the least. All right? This is what we have. We have to go we look today if you go to the next slide, 
here is one of the people, one of the golden souls of the latter part of the, of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, who warned the world, who took leadership against this war, where the British were trying to convince Sun Yat-sen that China should join the British Empire in this war. And he wrote this pamphlet, which we republished in Chinese, which is also now in English on the Lim website, called The Vital Problem of China, where he details the arguments that the British give for them to join. And, and, and Sun Yat-sen goes through a very competent expose of British methods, just like, like uh, uh, at, um, Palmerston said, the British have no long-term allies, only long-term interests. And, this is exact, and Sun Yat-sen goes through that. How were they able to finance the war, the British? Because they control India. They tax to death the Indian people. And he goes through how much that is and what the consequences are. What are the benefits to China? None. To con so this is uh, one of the lone voices in the world at the time who understood it precisely what King Edward and the British Empire was up to. Go to the next slide, please. Lynn recently going back to this idea of encirclement which is what King Edward VII did to Germany to uh, precipitate the control of the continental Europe. Lynn warned in November of 1976 when he put out this publication on the ring around China, Britain wants war. These conflagrations, 1996. And these are the various conflagrations, some of still are, w are quite active, to encircle China. What's the objective today? War with China. The British don't care, give a damn about Iran. Oh, there's some oil there. That's nice. They don't care about that. It's not strategic. China is strategic. And the United States is strategic, more important than China, to destroy that potential. That's the objective. The British want a land war in China. They want to see if they can get their friends in Japan. Maybe they're stupid enough to get involved in a land war in China. That's their objective. Their objective is not a simple war, the kind we would think of where you, you're going to have a confrontation with somebody. You might loot them afterwards and that's it. No, the idea is perpetual war forever. Their idea that is that this is the nature of man. Let's get real. The Let's United get serious. The United States is the one who installed the uh, nuclear, the bright nuclear power plant that allowed North Korea to produce nuclear weapons. Alleged nuclear weapons. Well, sure. <laughs> As they all, it turns out, are just alleged nuclear weapons. That's right. Go to the next slide. <laughs> so, like, we're the ones who want to start a yeah, war over there. Yeah, let me just finish. The, I'll, the just, I'll just be another minute. Like, it's not the British so much as it's the United States of America. Like, everything that you no, say it's the really British. applies to no, the United No, it's the British. States. I don't care if he's got an American citizenship. It's a British idea. <laughs> it's an evil idea. Here's what we got today. This is the potential. Here are the, here, here are the people who can press the button. I don't know if George could. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he's got a hard time reading his book on about the goat <laughs> upside down. This, this, as he was during the first 9-11. You go to the next slide, we have to look back at that potential we see. What's the cause? This guy is more evil than King Edward VII ever dreamt of being. Lord Bertrand Dirty Bertie Russell, <laughs> whose grandfather ran the Opium Wars, the British Empire in China. This is the guy who was out to destroy the human mind. Of course, what we think is human, he didn't consider that human. He spent 15 years of his life trying to destroy the idea of advanced mathematical physics. Right? He was, when you're, it's one thing to destroy a nation. It's a bigger crime to destroy an idea or a principle of an idea. Here you have him teaching at UCLA. 
He's actually teaching about when the United States is going to join the war in 1939. That's what he's got on the blackboard. Here he is after after one of the top guys of British intelligence who actually had a break with with H.G. Uh, Wells during World War One. They were part of this coefficients club because. Uh, Russell was arguing that the British Empire had to invest in advanced technology because those make the best weapons and we've got to keep up with the Joneses right? in Germany and the United States hence the laboratories of Aldermaston and so on Russell said no no technology at all the worst thing that happened to the human race was when a, a bloke stuck a pole in the ground and discovered agriculture no technology. No advanced science. Feudalism is the way to go. Going back. That was his idea. <laughs> and this guy is evil. And I mean consciously and deliberately. Not just a guy like, like uh, Eddie, King Eddie, who's tr manipulating people. This guy is getting into, the, into how to pervert science how to pervert the understanding and discovery of principles in nature. That's what he was about. To say, to codify the human mind like it's a computer. Right? To encyclopedize human knowledge. In fact, he said, we have learned everything of the universe. We don't need to learn anything else. That is it. You know it. <laughs> and what did he do after World War II? He was the one who organized dropping the bomb on Hiroshima. He played the key part in getting the United States to do that. And after World War II, he promoted what became known as Operation Drop Shot to get the United States to preemptively nuke Russia, drop nuclear weapons on Russia before the Russians developed the bomb. Of course, once the, the uh, Russians demonstrated they had a nuclear weapon, Dirty Birdie became a peacenik <laughs> and, started, and played a major role in banning the bomb, the ban the bomb movement, where he's being arrested here for a sit down in London, <laughs> you know, a, a real, because he's a peacenik, right? So it's a complete fraud. You have to look at where these ideas come from. This idea of perpetual warfare. What's the underpinning of what Cheney believes? We don't really care too much. He's not Why? all that important, power. except that he's the hired believe. gun in place now. But he didn't become what he is because of just being born. He was trained with and, uh, and accepted certain ideas by Leo Strauss in particular. Right? So here you have a situation today, if you go to the next slide, where we have the opportunity to complete the first land bridge, the first Eurasian bridge. This is LaRouche's solution. It's not enough to be against war. Most people are against war. <laughs> <laughs> That's that not funny? a big problem. Is that funny? I didn't get it. Well, it's Sorry, go ahead. I'm not sure. They can explain it. To you. I didn't know. But <laughs> the idea is you have to be for something positive. You have to have an idea what to do with the world so you don't have war, so you don't have this kind of condition we have presently. Right? So it's not enough to say, don't drop the bomb. What are you going to do? The bomb doesn't fall. What do you do? You have to have an idea of growth. You have to have an, a positive conception of, first of all, what a human being is. The idea of man. That's what the battle is all about. Going back to the American Revolution, going back to the fights of the carry networks against the British up to today. The fight is always over the idea of what is man. Obviously, Cheney and the lunatics around him don't believe that every human being has the potential to be more than a goat. That they're endowed with a, a creative mind that makes them different and more important than a goat. <laughs> right? They don't understand that. There but are better not. goats and there are lesser goats. And there's too many of those lesser goats. Mm -hmm. And there will always be war. Let's get real. That's the idea. That's the conception driving these lunatics to the brink of actions from which they cannot withdraw those actions. They will precipitate events which they cannot control. 
They think they might control them. They're not going to control them. You stop dropping nuclear weapons in Iran, you can't control that. You don't know what Putin's going to do. You don't know what some Russian general in Vladivostok's going to do. You don't know. You're, you're creating a situation of tremendous unknowable catastrophe. So it's better now to put out the fuse, i.e. Cheney. <laughs> Impeach him first. Put his butt where it belongs, in jail. So that's what I have to say about World War I. <laughs> the idea is it was a conscious and deliberate operation. So you can turn the lights on. So why should Cheney be put in jail? Well, where do you want to start? Uh, anywhere you'd like to start. I just like. To I like to go to the big ones. Treason. Treason. Because treason. of uh, treason. Starting a war. To start a war is one of the you greatest. You said that war is will always be. There's no reason. No, no. I was I was imitating Cheney. Okay, then. <laughs> so uh, I was I was not <coughs> proselytizing for the idea that it should always be war. I was just making fun of people who do. Yeah. Okay, and <coughs> he should, but he should be uh, put in jail. Why? treason. He should be put on trial first. I don't think he should be put... Well, he should be arrested, then put in jail. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not for lawlessness. <laughs> but I What's am for a higher idea of law. The evidence that you know against him? Lincoln, Pre President Lincoln, then Congressman Lincoln, from the floor of Congress, at the start of the Mexican-American Wars, stated that the greatest crime against the population is the right of kings to start wars because they do it arbitrarily. Uh -huh. And we created a constitution where that is not supposed to occur. And what we have is a lot of lies which have been promoted consciously out of Dick Cheney's office to get us into a war illegally. What, sto what, what created the panic among senators and congressmen to adopt this policy, it was really an executive order, though they did later vote for it, to go into war with, in Afghanistan and Iraq. It was based on what? Iraq had nuclear weapons, right? This was the drumbeat. And that's what scared the hell out of a number of congressmen and senators. That they, after 9-11, which was already panic-stricken the population, you had a situation where you had a country that was about to launch nuclear weapons, right? Do you remember the climate back then? Well, I remember that they, uh, turns out, didn't have any. That's right. Um, That's right. So that is the greatest crime against a nation. I agree with Lincoln on that. Is to is to. Uh, so what about the Halliburton thing? That's pretty weird. Yes, that's another one. That's another one, but that involves money. Like that might be a reason to lock him up. Yeah, I can think of more than one or two reasons, but I think we have start at the top, the most egregious, the most offensive to us and others. When I mean us, I, I was talking about America and the rest of the world is what has been done in our name, right, in this illegal war. Did you go through the uh, formation of Russia as a nation state in 1870? So I, I just. <laughs> it wasn't a, it was a nation state yes but it wasn't it was a it was a monarchy and it really didn't have a parliamentary type system until after the revolution of 1905 through the instigation of it actually they set up the beginnings of what would become self government that was the idea and because before that what do you have you have some of the, one of the problems in Europe as a whole is you have monarchies Right? Of course, and monarchs who are making decisions, even in the face of something evil as, as Edward VII. And you didn't have what you had in the United States. If you had what you had in the United States, it would have been a lot harder to do what Edward did. Because right? he was working on a personal basis. He knew how to manipulate uh, William II, Wilhelm. He knew it. He, in fact, he used to say, my greatest allies are all of William's failures and flaws. Because I know them all. <coughs> yeah. What what role did the Boxer Rebellion play in all of this? Because it seemed to be like couched within all these events. What what was the role of that? Well, it certainly had a destabilizing effect in Asia. This is how 
Lord General Charles Gordon got the nickname Chinese because he was in charge of British troops during the, the uh, Taiping Rebellion. And that's, that's the same thing, if I'm not mistaken. The Taiping is the same as the Boxer Rebellion, if I'm not mistaken. And this, this was a bunch of crazy lunatics <laughs> unleashing a destabilizing operation. But it was like, it was like this massive international yeah. mobilization for like three... It was. I mean, because the po I, I, you know, I can, you can speculate that the British did it because what the, see, the British didn't want, which they said they were for, was an open door for China. And McKinley wanted an open door, a real open door, which meant freedom of trade and commerce with China, right? For all, for anyone. The same with Korea and, and so forth. That be, was adopted as American policy, the open door, not carving up China. This is what Vita did not want to do these are the the uh, the British backed Japanese at the time, right? And taking part, they took part of Lower Manchuria, right? That he did not want that. Yet this was the British policy. I mean, and they would tolerate a certain carving up because they played this one power off the other at the time. And that's how I see it anyway: is that is that, that that the British would take advantage of that, even though you know some of their own troops got in the crossfire perhaps. And it may be a, co a consequence of long-term British destabilization. A lot of people do, in China did not like the British for obvious reasons. Um, but the people leading now were of no great shakes, that's for sure. And it caused, you know, all it really resulted in is, is chaos destabilization. And who would take advantage of that? That's what you have to ask yourself. So in 1904, did the Japanese attack Russia, or vice versa? Anyone Japanese attacked Russia in a preemptive war, not unlike Pearl Harbor, in many regards. The attack in in, uh, in uh, Port Arthur, and they and they were this see with the Anglo-American alliance that Edward had set up, it was guaranteed that no other uh, major European force would intervene because if the French intervened, according to the alliance, then the British would intervene, or the Germans. Though well, the Germans were relatively new on the scene in Asia at that time. How does LaRouche plan to hold uh, Cheney accountable, or uh, Bush, or uh, Secretary of Defense? What we have to do, I don't know if you were here earlier. In fact, uh, LaRouche addressed a meeting of uh, a cadre school we had put together in, in Boston today. And what he outlined to them is that we have to get the American people mobilized to prevent the war now. We can't wait to figure out all the different crimes and who did what to who. A cadre school like this one? Yeah, well, uh, it's for several days. It's more intensive. There, we're going to have one here shortly over Labor Day weekend, which you, I'm sure people will talk to you about. Um, but this, that means getting out the literature and the pamphlet to blow the operation. We have to expose that these guys are going for war. If you were here earlier and you well, heard we're Harley, at war already. I, yeah, knows. I know, but there's, there's a difference. Because what Cheney is doing is escalating this thing. This is not just simply, you know, a police action in, in Iraq where you know a dozen Americans get killed every week and two dozen Iraqis. We're talking about unleashing nuclear weapons to enter into this new era as they see it of war. This is insanity. And the way to prevent that, I think this this great article that Jeff Steinberg wrote is uh, it's going to be a blockbuster to get this thing around on these how these lunatics in military intelligence. We're training the same people who carried out 9-11. Uh, I mean, this is a blockbuster. This is how crazy. This is a window into the insanity going on in our own military. And uh, traditional military people have no order for this kind of stuff. But they're not going to do anything unless we make it public. You know, they'll help us give us intelligence, but we've got to get this thing out all over the place so it becomes known. So then if, if you have a bomb drop in Iraq, in Iran, 
people have to say Cheney did it. Right? That's we've got to get to that threshold in the population. That's why LaRouche is getting on as many talk shows personally as he can every day now, as many as possible. We have to we have boxes full of literature. We need help to get out. Saturate the population so they know this. Like I said, most people don't like war. <laughs> well, they ain't seen nothing yet if we don't stop these lunatics in the coming weeks. Because this is what they're up to. You know, we've got to put the the price for them going to war much higher. You know, we've got to make sure that all the congressmen aren't going to scurry under the nearest rock, you know, next time there's some kind of 9-11 incident. That we've got to start pointing the fingers now as who has the capability and the motive to do it. Right? It's like sort of exposing a murderer before he commits the act. <laughs> right? Because when you get, try somebody for murder, you've <coughs> got to have motive, opportunity, and means. Well, but except they've already committed the act, like repeatedly. No, but we're talking about a, a different manifold, a higher manifold of crime about to be committed. So we're going to something that's that's world historic, and that's the unleashing of nuclear weapons. That's that's a whole different ball of wax. How's he stopping that? We are stopped. We need to stop. What networks does he appear on? There's I can talk to people here. We've got every briefing you can see, the, the talk shows that he's on. We need more people to be educated and call in themselves. You know, we have to create a, a, a tidal wave. You know, LaRouche has taken the, the point on this, but he can't do it by himself. And we've got to create a, a, a real tidal wave. And we've got the means to do it. We've got the intelligence. We've got the pamphlets. Let's get them out. Yeah, that's the cabinet's first point. Yeah, it's to educate people. Show them how they can change history, so we don't have to be victims of you know the next Edward the Seventh or Dick Cheney, and say we can't do anything about it. <laughs> well, there's plenty we can do about it. <laughs> if you want to change it, you can. Anything else? Okay, guys.